All right. Uh, next up, we are on to the bowels. We're Time moving for guts. down. We are down in the guts. We've moved down quite a bit. We're almost to the end, <laughs> uh, but not quite. <laughs> so um, let's start by talking a little bit about Ilias. Ilias? Ilias. How do you Ilias. pronounce it? Ilias. Ilias. Um, basically, Ilias is um, some problem with peristalsis in the entire bowels. Why does it happen? It happens because there's some insult um, that causes the entire bowel bowel, the small bowel, large bowels, to be irritated and not function the way that they typically like to function. Cranky. The cranky bowels. Um, so the way that you would see it on a, a CT image would be a diffuse dilatation of the small bowels and the large bowels, but not so big that everything looks like it's about to burst. Um, one way uh, to remember how big everything is supposed to be, there's a three, six, nine rule. Um, the small bowel should be a little bit small. It should be smaller than three centimeters. When it gets above that level, you're concerned about SBO. The large bowel should be about six, no bigger than six centimeters. If it's larger than that, then that is a um, problem. And then uh, if you get there, any segment greater than nine centimeters is a huge problem. So you can see here that th things are dilated, but they're not dilated to the point where you're super concerned. And so again, what causes it? Basically anything. Anything can make the bowels a little bit cranky. So infections can make them, make them upset. The electrolyte problems, of course, after surgery, um, people can get, develop an ileus and have some you know, cramping, pain, and all this kind of stuff, but they don't usually look terribly ill. And the treatment is to reverse whatever the underlying problem is for the most part. Now, ileus differs from the other things of obstruction, the other causes of obstruction that we talk about, which are actually emergencies. So small bowel obstruction, we'll start there, and then we'll go down into the large bowel. Small bowel obstructions, the number one and number two causes for small bowel obstruction will be adhesions and hernias. And if we're gonna compare the two types of obstructions, these patients tend to present much more acutely. They come in with more intense pain, vomiting, belly pain. They don't tend to have as big of a protuberant, sort of distended belly. Um, these patients come in a little bit more sick. Now, you can notice there that malignancy is in the potential causes, but it's not the top two causes. Um, whereas we'll see with LBOs, the majority of those are due to malignancies. Now, what will you see on the CAT scan? So we talked about the 369 rule that you shouldn't have dilatation more than three centimeters. But the other thing to look at on the um, CT or on imaging is sort of the location. If yeah. it's very centrally located, that's more indicative of, of small bowel. And as you remember from the anatomy, the large bowel sort of goes around the periphery. Um, and so you'll see large bowel obstruction sort of out on the periphery of the CT or the X-ray. Now, we don't have an X-ray image up here, but if you were to get an X-ray that has multiple air fluid levels and dis uh, multiple yeah. distended loops, mm -hmm. or in one loop you get two, two air fluid levels, <coughs> problem. That mm -hmm. is a clincher for the diagnosis of right, small Right, and the, and the CT scans are always supine, right? So sometimes right. you'll see something that looks like, well, it looks kind of normal. I don't see any air fluid levels, but you don't, right? You only see them when you see that the, you know, you don't see that on the on the cuts where the patient's mm -hmm. lying flat because you're getting this, but you will see them when they do actually a transverse cut. And so um, take a look on the internet, find one of those pictures um, so you have that ready in your mind. Um, and then in terms of treatment, what do we do? This is a surgical consultation. Yeah. Whether or not surgery is done or not, it is always a surgical consultation, so that yeah. will be the right, right answer. Their decision to go non-op or operative. They put them on MPO IV fluids. Now, we used to put NG tubes on all these patients. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think that the, the recommendation now is more if the patient is vomiting, very, yeah. very ill appearing, um, definitely an NG tube, but um, it doesn't always need to be in there if they can, if you can be watched, but can help if they're distended. And then the non-operative route, you can do a, a GI follow-through, gastrographin challenge, um, and that can help, um, but some, if that doesn't work and the patient's still symptomatic, they'll need to go um, for operative intervention. And of course, if they perf, that's a huge problem and you need to add antibiotics mm -hmm. and, um, and move ahead with a little bit more urgency or a lot more urgency. So large bowel obstruction. So we talked about the small bowel centrally located about three centimeters. Now we're talking about the large bowel. You can see how much more dilated these loops are and they're more peripherally uh, oriented here. What are the major causes? So we talked about malignancy being the number three for small bowel. It is number one, number one, number one for large bowel. And then the more some of the more testable things yeah. here tend to be the volvulus, which is the next most common, about 10 to 15%. And we see these. 
And we, oh yeah, and um, the sigmoid and the cecal volvuluses are the ones that we're going to focus on. Um, so we'll give you some clues on how to uh, distinguish between the two. So here's a CT scan of the large bowel. You can see here there's mention of a closed loop bowel obstruction, which means that the ileocecal valve is closed off and now you're getting these big distended um, areas. And when it's closed loop like this, this needs to be intervened on um, ASAP. And then sigmoid and cecal volvulus, there are some similarities, but there are a lot of differences, yeah. both in terms of diagnosis and management. So let's jump into that. Um, this is just another slide comparing the small bowel and colon. We've gone through most of this already. All right, so colonic volvulus, two major types. There's the majority type, 80%, which are sigmoid, and then 15%, which are cecal. The way I remember these, sigmoid starts with an S. I think about that as the senile volvulus. <laughs> the cecal, I think What's about as... Uh, well, you could either go with child or congenital. <laughs> There's a couple different ways you can think about it, but child or congenital will be the cecal. The, now, like, think back to the anatomy. The cecum is the very, mo the most proximal portion of your large bowel where it connects with the, with the small bowel. So that is very proximal, and that has implications in terms of management, which we'll talk about. Sigmoid is down at the bottom, right be before the rectum, um, and is accessible by sigmoidoscopy, so we'll talk about how we, we treat those as well. Um, so how is it going to, uh, which patients get each of these? We talked about cecal being younger, child, congenital. There is a problem with the uh, fixation to the peritoneum. So these things twist very proximally in the large bowel and cause this huge obstructive picture that will often be likened to a kidney bean pattern. So you get this sort of big dilated loop that looks like a kidney bean. These require surgery. Why? Is there any kind of scope that you're going to be able to loop all the way around the bowel yeah, to get to this that. thing? You're not going to be able to mm -hmm. do it. So surgery is going to be the um, treatment here. Sigmoid volvulus, these are more the patients that we think, oh, let, let me go back here. The, the young acute onset, oftentimes they'll give you a history of like a marathon runner or somebody yeah, who's- they tend to, Yeah, it's young, it tends to be men. Young, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. young, healthy. And then the sigmoid volvulus, the vast majority of these volvulus cases are gonna be the, like the elderly woman that you see rocking back and forth <laughs> in the picture, looking very comfortable actually. She looks pretty good, yeah. I like her, shoe, her red <laughs> shoes are good. Um, but if you know, if you're uh, probably more debilitated than this lady, um, chronic motility issues, those are the patients that you'll often get from like a nursing home or something like that. And it's a lot more insidious in onset. So we talked about earlier how small bowel obstructions come on acute and can look pretty sick. These volvulus cases and the, the large bowel obstructions in general sort of be, tend to be more insidious in onset. When it twists this thing, the sigmoid volvulus, you'll see this bent inner tube pattern where you can see sort of a U-shaped kind of Yeah, I think uh, of these of as balloon animals. Oh, I like that. So you blow up a lot, those long yeah. skinny balloons, just twist the end, that's cecum. Fold it over on itself, that's sigmoid. So now every time, now I've ruined balloon animals for you for life, <laughs> but that's, I think, of sigmoid and sigmoid volvulus when I watch people making balloon animals. Well, maybe that you, says something about me. If you, if you do see this balloon animal thing on the, on the CT, the treatment it will be, you can actually, because it's so close to the rectum, do a sigmoidoscopy yeah. and do a decompression that way. Uh, constipation. Can we talk about this for the next 20 minutes? Yes, it's very interesting. <laughs> Fascinating, actually. Um, so constipation, again, uh, we're not going to go through all the causes of constipation, nor will it be likely that you're going to get a lot of constipation. Like, the answer is not going to be give them uh, Miralax, you know, on the test. But if they're giving you somebody who's obstipated, yeah. who isn't having any bowel bowel movements and things like that, be thinking about obstruction as one of the more, co more, more dangerous causes of this. All right. So abdominal hernias. So they, you, got, you all remember the inguinal hernias that are direct and indirect and all the various forms of abdominal hernias. So some big sort of overlying concepts to be thinking about for this exam. Um, hernias that are reducible should be reduced. Hernias that are big, red, and tender, and the patient looks ill, um, are probably either incarcerated or fully strangulated. And the way to think about incarceration and strangulation, everybody probably has their mnemonics or thought, like the image that they have in med school, but uh, uh, incarceration, you think about something's in jail, but they're not like terribly... It can't get uh, out, but it's not, it's not it's just hanging out. They're just hanging out behind the bars. Um, but somebody that's strangulated, that person is getting, that's, someone's getting choked off and the problems are about to arise. So um, a strangulated hernia is one where the blood supply is being completely choked off and that is a surgical emergency. And you don't want to shove that back in, right? That, that's, do not shove it yeah, back. Yeah, you don't want to do that. So which of these hernias 
might you get on the exam that are at higher risk for incarceration and subsequent strangulation? Um, so let's start with the inguinal hernias, those being the most common. Um, the inguinal hernias, it, it, there's, if you're lateral or medial to the inferior epigastric vessels, if you're lateral to it, it's indirect. If you're medial to it, it's direct. The indirects tend to uh, incarcerate more than the directs, mm -hmm. but you won't know that necessarily on the exam. But if they give you the picture, that probably is what they're going for. Um, some of the other ones, femoral hernias are interesting. Those can pre present a little bit like groin pains, things like that. You it, see they those might, in women. In women. Yeah. Yeah, so that gets missed in women sometimes because, like, who can get one woman can get a hernia down there? Well, yeah, that's the one, and it's dangerous. It's a problem when when uh, a woman gets a femoral hernia; those tend to get incarcerated. Now, the most common hernia in women is still inguinal hernia, but it is far more common for if you have someone with a femoral hernia that it is a woman. So uh, yeah. either way, <laughs> the, 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 yeah. it, probably neither here nor there for the exam, but just, uh, just so you know. And then um, if you get a spagalian hernia, if Love they're telling that. you it's up in the rectus, like around the abdomen to the side, and they're having severe pain there, and you can feel a hernia sac, those are likely to get incarcerated. And that's fun to say anyway, spagalian. spagalian. I mean, that's like fun. It is fun. Um, obturator hernia is another very rare one that they may give you that presents with thigh, groin pain kind of thing. Also higher risk for incarceration. All right, bowel perf. Um, mm. Ideally, if you're going through some progressive case, you don't get to this stage. But if you do get to this stage, again, five alarm fire. Um, so what are the most common causes? Well, it's the most common causes of infection in the abdomen, diverticulitis, ap apes can um, all perf. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of other, basically anything that causes inflammatory changes in the bowel can cause this. Um, if you're going to get a perforation in the bowels, it's more likely to be large bowel than small bowel. Um, and then we're going to look for air under the diaphragm as a clue. So let's see if... That's on an upright chest x-ray. So that's... But there's lots of places to look for air. You'll go in that later. Yeah. Well, let's see. We have it right here. Here we are. Um, so you'll see some pneumoperitoneum. On the left side of the abdomen, it's always difficult to tell if it's air bubble, air bubble mm -hmm. in the gastric. But if you're ever on the right side and you see this little pocket of air down there, that is never okay, never normal. We were talking about gallbladder disease earlier. If you get emphysematous um, cholecystitis and that bursts, that can cause a picture like this. So if they're giving you a gallbladder sort of picture, that's what you may might be thinking about. Um, but this is perf um, viscous, and this is concerning for either mesenteric ischemia or some right. other perf. Um, or a di per perf tick. Or, and this is the kind of one, uh, these are the kind of x-rays that you kind of like on a shift, right? Mm -hmm. It's like your, your dispo is on that x-ray. You're done. Done. Mm -hmm. surgery. Um, again, the most common cause of perf viscous period is still peptic ulcer disease yep. that we talked about earlier. Um, but when, it, when we're talking about the bowels and everything else, you're going to be thinking about maybe like a mesenteric ischemia or something that ruptured. All right. So here are some, a couple more images of uh, pneumoperitoneum. And this is why it's worth telling your, um, putting on your little note when you order something, you know, rule out perf viscous, because they'll look for the funny little places where the air might be, where it isn't in bowel, where you might get fooled. They'll, they'll look on purpose for those funny little pockets right. where it tends to go when it's free air. Like this, the intrahepatic yeah. fissure, as you can mm -hmm. see in this uh, photo here. All right, let's switch gears. We're going to go into other types of bowel problems, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases and irritable bowel syndromes. Okay. So how do we distinguish between the two? In what ways are these similar? In what ways are they different? Um, IBS tends to be the one that is less tested on, but it's important to know in case you get it as a foil, you know, maybe they'll give you that as a potential cause. But IBS and IBD are both similar in that they are sort of recurrent type mm -hmm. syndromes. You get these recurrent episodes of crampiness. You might get some diarrhea and th that kind of thing. Irritable bowel syndrome um, tends to be either associated with, they might give you some history of psychiatric um, stuff going on as well, or just, you know, regular people can get this too. Uh, the treatment, can you can try rifaximin, but it's mostly symptomatic treatment, mm -hmm. so not a whole lot to do. There is a lot more to unpack with inflammatory bowel disease, and there's, your money is going to be in um, making sure you know all the different manifestations and forms that a patient may present with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So let's talk about the two most common, the, the two causes of inflammatory bowel disease, which are regional enteritis, otherwise known as Crohn's, Crohn's. and ulcerative colitis. We'll talk about the similarities between the two as well as the differences. So here are some syndrome, uh, irritable bowel syndrome symptoms, which you can see range from not just GI issues, but just whole body sort of somatic, somatic symptoms. Um, there's the Rome criteria that we put here for your reference. I would not memorize these, <laughs> um, but basically it's abdominal pain with some changes in stool form, frequency, et cetera. Um, 
All right, so let's jump into Crohn's disease. So what is Crohn's disease? Crohn's disease is an inflammatory disorder that involves all the layers of, of the uh, GI wall. So, and then it can involve, go all the way from mouth all the way to the rectum. And um, because all the walls are involved, it's a uh, complete uh, involvement of all three layers. You can develop all sorts of fistulas, mm -hmm. and it can, you know, if it touches another piece of bowel, then those two fistulas together, and you can get fistulas with the GU tract. You can get, get all kinds of things. It's not pleasant. Um, and then you get the skip lesion phenomenon. With all sort of colitis, everything is continuous, and Crohn's, everything is sort of skipped. So how will a patient present with Crohn's disease? The way that they will likely present on the exam is recurrent bouts of abdominal crampiness, abdominal pain. They'll, they'll likely give you diarrhea. Sometimes it's bloody. Uh, it's far more common to get bloody diarrhea and ulcerative colitis, but about 50% of Crohn's patients can get it too. Uh, and then with Crohn's specifically, they might give you this history of fissures mm -hmm. or um, fistulas and that kind of thing. So a couple other things to think about with um, Crohn's disease specifically, if they give you kidney stones, that right. might be a clue. So you're getting this recurrent crampy thing, fevers, um, and then they throw in kidney stones, that might be a good uh, test exam question. And then this is usually um, diagnosed with scope and biopsy, which we're not doing in the emergency department. No. But the treatment is going to be for a flare, steroids, yeah. and then there's all kinds of immunosuppressants and things that GI will um, start the patient on. The, we'll talk about ulcerative colitis and we'll put it all together. So ulcerative colitis, already we've talked about some of the differences. The difference with ulcerative colitis is it does not involve all three layers. So you don't get all these fistulas and all these other yeah, things. It almost should be called ulcerative colonitis rather than colitis. Colonitis. Yeah. colonitis. I mean, we should, add, we should change the name because it's strictly just the colon. It's just the colon. It, and it, that is the only segment. So if you get rid of the entire colon, then you pretty much solve the problem. But Crohn's, you couldn't do that. You can't remove anybody, the entire gut no. from a person. So um, the GI symptoms are similar, recurrent, crampy. They, all, they have far more likely to have bloody diarrhea. Almost always they'll yeah. have bloody diarrhea on the STEM question. Um, and the major complication actually for both will be this toxic megacolon. If you get a history of somebody with um, recurrent symptoms concerning for IBD and they get uh, their febrile or they have peritonitis or anything and you see this on a CT, this, is a sur this becomes no longer a medical disease but now a surgical yeah. disease. And this is what makes this, both these conditions so testable. Not only do they have the intestinal manifestations that we just talked about, but there are all these extra intestinal mm -hmm. things that really go well with images. Yep. So if you see, let's go through each of these. If you see somebody with recurrent abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea, and they show you the picture on the left. Those th legs. Those legs. Um, that is erythema nodosum. Very classic. Um, the second picture on the right, that is uh, pyoderma gangrenosum. And then if they give you a kind of blurry vision or mm -hmm. something else, so you're getting arthralgias and you get one of these pictures. And also they have some changes in their vision, like uveitis. That is a clincher for the diagnosis. This is another chart highlighting all the multi uh, myriad of differences between the two diseases. And I think that's it. Anything else yeah. to add for No, IBD? the only thing is that we, usually, we don't usually make that diagnosis de novo. You mentioned that. Right. That that's something, we'll, we, as long as they're stable, their hemoglobins are stable, they're not, their belly's okay, we often just refer okay. um, those people. Um, it may, we may be asked even in the first you know, suspected diagnosis to start something like a steroid, right. but they often don't. They often want just referral. It's the flares, you're right, yep. that we usually end up treating in the emergency department. Flares, steroids, toxic megacolon, surgery, antibiotics. Yep. Um, and then all the diagnostics that we talked about. Perfect. Um, so, Appy, uh, you, uh, people you don't need to hear everything about appendicitis. The typical presentation will be it starts periumbilical, sort of in that visceral phase, and then becomes uh, soma uh, uh, somatic um, as it mi migrates down to the right lower quadrant. That's typical. You get the nausea, you get the anorexia, you get the bumpy. They might give you, a, like, you know, on the, the car right the there. Car ride. It hurts. <laughs> it hurts w when I was uh, hitting all the speed bumps. Now, um, it's important to know that perforations are higher in elderly patients and in small children. Um, yeah. White counts, if they're high, great. If they're normal, still be thinking about appendicitis. Now, there are all sorts of different atypical presentations of appendicitis yeah. that they may be giving you. So I just gave you the typical, um, but atypicals, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through in a sec. Yeah. Uh, so in this slide, they also talk about diagnoses. So the ultrasound will be a good first line diagnosis for someone who's thin. Um, 
children, uh, and then you're going to be looking for a non-compressible appendix that's greater than six millimeters. So oftentimes, it's a nice first test, especially in children and yeah. pregnant patients Don't if they ask radiate. you on the test. Right. Totally. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, a skinny adult, that I think it's totally reasonable to start with as well. But CT, the sp sensitivity and specificity is very good. Um, and you can s consider yeah. MR in pregnant women. Hundred percent. And I was mm -hmm. going to say, for pregnant women, if a ultrasound is unremarkable, then your next test would be MRI. Mm -hmm. um, in your typical adult, if the ultrasound is negative, then the next test might be CT. just CT. Uh, all right, so how are all the different, what are all the different atypical ways that an appendicitis may present? Um, if, it's, if the appendix is pushing up against the bladder, you might get some pyrrhea. If it's pushing up against the ureters, you might get some red blood cells. If it's retrocecal and down below, you may get some low back pain or rectal pain. So they may give you somebody who has some, you know, periumbilical going down, and then they tell you something about a rectal exam, and you're confused. Well, it's because they're having, uh, you know, that's one atypical presentation mm -hmm. of a retrocecal. In pregnancy, if mm -hmm. somebody's coming in, it, the abdominal contents can get pushed up, and they can have a right upper quadrant pain. So just don't be fooled by some of these atypical presentations. Yeah. The treatment is, although uh, there is a lot of literature now on antibiotics being an okay first-line option, generally the surgery is the um, answer that we're looking for yep. here. Oh. All right. Mesenteric ischemia. Does it matter? This no. is it matters in real life and we see yeah. it sometimes in real life, but we see it often on exams. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's true. So it's ABEM general. It's it very is common. ABEM general. This is uh, one out of every three patients will have mesenteric <laughs> ischemia. How do mesenteric ischemic patients present? So there are two, I think about two major categories of presentations that they will give you. So a mesenteric ischemia pathophys, you can either have an arterial embolus, you can have an arterial thrombus um, into your mesenteric uh, vessels. You can have a low flow state where people are just not getting enough blood flow to the intestine. And then finally, you can get some venous um, thrombosis in that area. So there's four sort of categories there. And the way that the patient presentations um, will, will come on are abdominal angios, somebody that has some atherosclerosis in the vessels. Mm -hmm. Every time e they eat, they start to have severe abdominal pain, and then it goes away. So it's sort of this crescendo, do crescendo thing with meals. The other way that they like to present this is somebody with AFib or some risk for throwing off a clot. That tends to be in the patients with cardiomyopathy. They may give uh, AFib, like we said, is like a very, very common yeah. presentation. So if you get AFib plus sudden onset abdominal pain, done. This is what they're looking for, um, especially with the pain out of proportion. Leukocytosis and lactic acidosis are lab findings you should be looking for. Again, nothing rules out. But if you have leukocytosis, and particularly in mesenteric ischemia, they'll probably give you a a white count that's higher than what you're anticipating. Mm -hmm. So these patients, when they get truly ischemic in their bowels, can have white counts of 20, 25, 30. Um, and so if you see that sort of constellation, be really thinking about this um, presentation. Lactic acidosis is a finding that we often talk about. Hyperphosphate phosphates can go up later on. Um, and then I don't think we have it on this slide, but um, digoxin can also be uh, something that you think about as a, uh, a as a risk factor um, and beta blockers. Yeah, they don't. The, and the kinds of questions, these kinds of questions, what they do is they may not give you AFib. They may give you a history of meds that would mm. be used to control AFib, yeah. so a beta blocker and maybe somebody's on warfarin. Um, they may give you the EKG that you need to mm. notice that AFib is on there. They're, they may, I'll tell you, because they're aware that we're aware of this disorder, <laughs> they're not going to hand you this diagnosis on a question. They're going to make you work for it. So you know these things in your head. Just look for them specifically when they give you the, you know, the, the, all the little stimuli with the question. So totally. click on those bo boxes and look at that EKG. You're just looking for, the, you're just looking for all the clues. But this should always be, you know, I always think with any, any uh, complaint, chief complaint in the emergency department, it's rare that it's a vascular catastrophe, that that is the cause. But on this exam, every time you see abdominal pain, <laughs> headache, I don't care what it is. It's a triple A. It's, a, it's, it's an exploding a artery yeah. or a lack of oxygen <laughs> to that artery first and foremost before you go down to anything else. And so for mesenteric ischemia, if you get to, uh, you don't get the clues that you need and the history or the stem, they might be giving you the yeah, clues in the form mm -hmm. of a picture. So if they're telling you there's an elderly patient that's coming in with abdominal pain and then they're showing you this or an x-ray where you see these little bubbles around the bowel wall, that is indicative of pneumatosis intestinalis. It's very, uh, it's consistent with mesenteric infarct and is concerning. And then the other finding is if you see these 
thickened bowel walls that are far thicker than what you're used to, this is, um, this is concerning for uh, mesenteric ischemia. If they ask you which exam to get, typically they're looking for a CTA. Of course, the gold standard is a full angiogram, but um, a CTA is probably what's going to be most likely in the emergency department. Treatment, this is a surgical consult. Um, MPO IV fluids, if they have a vena, particularly if they have a venous cause, they will uh, oftentimes get heparin and anticoagulation. Um, for the arterioles, you, you want to talk to your consultants. Um, and then if the patient has an acute mesenteric arterial occlusion, there's a couple different approaches, but both are surgical. Um, so they probably won't ask you the difference between the two, but laparotomy is one way you can go. And if um, someone is a candidate, they might get a primary endovascular approach. And then the non-occlusive, so the other patient presentation that I forgot to mention is somebody who's on three pressers and they're in the yeah, ICU right, the and now flow. they're having mm -hmm. you know abdominal pain and some elevated lactate. That is a low flow state, yeah. and that and you we just don't tend to see that in the ER. Class. Although every once in a while, like, we've all had people we hold in the ER mm -hmm. for longer than we should, yeah. um, and that may it, it isn't just low flow; it's low oxygen delivery. So it can be even somebody who gets a really low hemoglobin, where they're getting ischemia just because they don't have enough blood supply. Um, but that that's and that's a flow state and you just fix the, you fill the tank That's right. with whatever needs to be filled. It's like demand ischemia, but for the yeah. belly. All right, and we are now to the final part of the bowel. Um, and we are going to wrap up uh, this segment in a moment. So bear with us through diverticular disease. This is so diverticular disease is very common in the United States, but apparently in in Japan uh, it's flipped. So yeah. it, when you're thinking left lower quadrant pain in America, they might give you a patient from Japan or something that has right And they really right might give you a patient from Japan that has it from an Asian patient because that's and that, and that's a known entity that yep. it's more for the boards. Yeah. It's, it's a great great sort ABM of ABM general. There you go. Uh, lots of Japanese diverticulitis at Abem General. <laughs> All right, so um, this tends to happen in the sigmoid colon. So let's talk a little bit about the nomenclature. A diverticula is an outpouching in the in the bowel, um, typically in the sigmoid region, but not always. And that can be. Uh, that can occur if it happens with more than one diverticula and you start getting multiple, then you can get this condition called diverticulosis. We talked about it in the yeah, lower GI bleed. So those patients would likely come in with painless bleeding, like this woman at church yeah, that you had mentioned. Lady. Yeah. Um, and so you treat that with, uh, as, as you would for, um, pain, uh, for uh, lower, lower GI bleed. But what we're looking for specifically here is diverticulitis. And diverticulitis will often uh, be an, an inflammatory, possibly infectious. There's some controversy about whether this is an inflammatory or an infectious disease. Um, in Europe, they, they've kind of gotten away from yeah. treating this as an infection, yeah, they, yeah, they'd, potentially. At least they're le le not sick ones anyway. They just treat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So diverticulitis. So if you do identify someone with left lower quadrant pain and you end up uh, with or without imaging, you diagnose diverticulitis, then the treatment will either be, in America, um, antibiotics and analgesia. And even if it perfs and you get like micro perfs and micro abscesses, it's still the right answer is still to give antibiotics. Yeah. They don't necessarily need to go to surgery. Mm -hmm. But um, if you have a complication like that, probably, you know, they, they might ask you whether to admit or discharge. If you get elderly, m multiple comorbidities, you're not going to, you're probably going to keep those patients yeah. in um, and give antibiotics as an inpatient. If it's a young, healthier person, you could give outpatient antibiotics. But what causes these patients to be operative? Um, abscesses. So they get these large abscesses that might require IR drainage versus the laparotomy or perforation. If you get peritonitis on these patients, you're That's finished easy. That's and easy. you're done. All right. And that just about wraps up the bowels. And to All right. Oh, no, well, we're, we're still gonna, in the we're bowels. Be we're in the talking bowels. about diarrhea. Just yeah, a little differently.